Hi, this is Kevin Trainer, and I'd like to welcome you to my lecture on Chapter 1 of the Schwalbe text. And Chapter 1 is called Introduction to Project Management. You should see your slides on your screen. Um, we begin by uh, trying to convey how motivated people in a wide range of professions are to seek formal project management. And we're hoping that that uh, motivation is going to extend to you. And given the fact that you signed up for this course, it, it, it probably has. So um, there are lots of kinds of organizations uh, today that um, are either newly interested or have renewed their interest in project management. Um, uh, yeah, particularly with IT related uh, projects, which take up a lot of our funds. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to apply formal project management to IT projects. So Back in 2014, um, worldwide IT spending was $3.8 trillion. That's a lot of money. And that was a 3.2% increase over the 2013 spending. Um, there are a lot of people involved in formal project management. Um, so already, let's see. PMI, the Project Management Institute, estimates demand for uh, project managers, who I'm going to call PMs, at 15.7 million people from uh, 2010 to 2020, with uh, 6.2 million of those jobs in the United States. And uh, most of the people in the class are in the United States, not all. Uh, but certainly, uh, to the extent that y you acquire these uh, skills and uh, pursue them, then you could become part of that uh, job opportunity as well. Uh, now, why are we so interested in uh, um, pursuing formal project management? Well, uh, especially in the IT area, uh, projects don't have a good track record, okay? And uh, a study that gets pointed to all the time is a study done in 1995. Now that's uh, 20 years ago, 21 years ago as I speak. It found that only 6.2% of IT projects were successful. This is the famous uh, chaos study done by the Standish Group. Um, and when we talk about uh, success, we're talking about we, were they able to meet their original goals for the scope, the time, and the cost of the project? And they weren't, except for 16.2% of them. So that's pretty low by anybody's estimation. And over 31% of IT projects were canceled before completion. So that's pretty high. You know, that's a, almost a third. And um, a further study by Price Waterhouse Coopers found that overall half of all projects fail. Uh, so that's half. And only 2.5% two, two of corporations consistently meet their original targets for scope, time, and cost goals for all types of projects. Now, this seems really dismal. Um, I just want to point out that we're eventually going to have a more sophisticated idea of how we're going to meet scope, time, and cost goals. And that idea is going to be tempered by this. We're going to um, as we learn more about the project over time, we are going to shift our goals to reflect that greater knowledge, okay? So um, the question is not, 
really whether we met our original goals, but how well we kept up with our uh, increasing and deepening information about the project as the project went forward. So there are successful projects in, in which uh, the original ideas about the scope, the time, and the cost were off. Okay, and that could be true for all but 16.2% of them. But uh, over time, um, the team that managed the project got an increasingly accurate grip on those things. And um, somehow the organization was able to uh, come to grips with the revised uh, scope time and cost, and they were able to get the the job done. So this learning more over time factor um, really is what makes this um, low percentage that you get from the from the chaos study a little more uh, palatable. It's just very difficult in the beginning of these IT projects to know how big they're going to be. It doesn't mean that we ought to be in the dark the whole time though. Okay, in, in uh, selling formal project m management, there, uh, there are a bunch of advantages that we like to uh, sell, and they're here on slide four. Better control of resources, including uh, financial, physical, and human. Improve customer relations. Shorter development times on IT projects, lower costs, high qual higher quality and reliability, higher profits for the organization, improved productivity, better coordination, higher worker morale. Well, it's hard to argue with a lot of these things. I mean, these are, are pretty basic uh, things that we all want for our organization. So, um, and it's good to know that we're uh, selling formal PM with the idea that we can make these kinds of improvements. Now, I just want to point out that these improvements are not without a cost, okay? So there is incremental effort that goes into formal PM, okay? And that has a cost. We're going to say that um, the formal approaches that we're going to recommend that you follow do have a cost, but they're outweighed by the advantages that we see here. So we'll be talking about the cost and how they relate to the costs and how they relate to these advantages as we go through the course. So let's talk a little bit about what a project is, because I, I think we all have a kind of a gut feel for what it is. But the formal definition, as uh, promoted by the PMI organization, is um, insightful. So a project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. So it's temporary. Projects have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We like to contrast projects with their counterpart in the business uh, and organizational world, which um, is continuing operations. So continuing operations is work that we do within our organization to sustain the business, okay? And we have an ecosystem that kind of works like this. Um, every day we wake up and we go to work and we run continuing operations, okay? And then from time to time, we decide we'd like to make improvements in our continuing operation. We'd like to change our processes. We'd like to add a product. We'd like to um, get rid of a product. We'd like to add a service. We'd like to get rid of a service, okay? We form projects to make those changes in continuing operations. And typically, what we do is we assign a team of people to that project. They do the project, and when it's over, they hand the results over, <clears throat> excuse me, to the rest of the organization. Um, 
and the um, the outputs from that project become a part of continuing operations. So projects certainly don't last forever. Okay, the need for projects grows out of the day-to-day -day experience and continuing operations. And when projects are over, their benefits are absorbed by continuing operation and the projects go away. And to the extent that we've got people who are mostly absorbed by, by projects, then they go in search of some other project, either in the same organization if they're internal people, or in some other organization if they're, say, outside consultants. So projects end when their objectives have been uh, reached and the project has been uh, terminated. Projects can be large or small, and they can take a shorter, long amount of time to complete. Having said that, there is a certain overhead for looking at work as a formal project, okay? And um, it's probably true that when uh, some kind of undertaking is small enough, people might go about it in a project-like way, but they might not use uh, many of the formal tools that we're to, uh, going to talk about in the course because, uh, oh geez, it's a temporary endeavor that is easily managed by common sense, you know, informal project management. Okay, so there is a kind of a size hurdle, but once you pass that, projects come in all, uh, all sizes and all lengths. So, um, because our text um, is uh, ITPM based, and because our slides uh, came with our text, um, there's a little more information about IT projects here than about other projects. So, uh, what would IT projects look like? Well, here are some examples. Its team of students creates a smartphone application and sells it online. Uh, I just want to point out, selling it online is probably continuing operation. So, and prepares to sell it online? That sounds like the project, okay? A company develops a driverless car. A government groups develops a system to track child immunizations. A global bank acquires other financial institution and needs to consolidate systems and procedures. So that's the need for a project, okay? Um, probably each acquisition or maybe a small group of ac acquisitions would become the project uh, itself. So let's uh, take a, a closer look uh, at uh, projects uh, themselves and their nature. So a project has a unique purpose. It's temporary, okay, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's developed using progressive elaboration. Uh, and that's an interesting idea that PMI is very high on and that I like. So um, we'll be talking about that as we go through the course. It requires resources. This is the cost, often from uh, various areas of your organization. So what do we mean by resources? Uh, money, people, things. Okay. Projects should have a primary customer or a sponsor because we need leadership and funds. Okay. So the project sponsor usually provides the direction and funding for the project. Okay. In a realistic world, okay, um, we need to find people to fund our activities. And so we look to project sponsors who are typically senior managers in most organizations. We look for uh, them to uh, 
help to uh, direct the project, help to choose the goals and keep it on track, and provide the funding. And but projects involve uncertainty, okay? And that's just kind of the nature of these things, especially when you consider that most projects that we do, this is the first time we're doing exactly this uh, project. We do have some where we do kind of cookie cutter projects, I would call them. So we install our system at a new branch library. Well, perhaps it's the 15th branch library that we've done this for, okay? So there's some uncertainty, but not a whole lot, okay? Um, perhaps though, when we install our system at the first branch uh, library, there's a lot more uncertainty. So the uncertainty can be uh, high or low, but there's always some. Now let's talk about uh, project managers and program managers. Are they the same thing? Well, no, not in the formal language of uh, uh, PM. So project managers are people who work with project sponsors, the project team, and other people involved in a project to meet project goals. Well, if that's a project, then what's a program? Well. A program is a, a, potentially a group of related projects managed in a coordinated way to obtain the benefits and control not available from managing them individually. Are all projects considered to be part of a program? No. Okay, so a lot of projects are unique enough that there aren't other closely related projects that we want to group them with. But, um, um, well, the classic example for me of a program is uh, an aerospace uh, company like uh, Boeing will, um, historically, when they come up with a new, uh, a new airliner that they want to build, like the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, they will uh, have a program. So they have a 787 program. They have a person who's responsible for managing the program. The person is a program manager. Within that, they have individual projects because you can imagine that um, a single project to, uh, to develop something as complex as an airliner uh, is uh, probably too complex for a single project. We want to divide it up into sub-projects that are related. And we want to manage them in sort of a related kind of optimal way. So this, this uh, program idea really came out of, uh, oh, defense uh, contracting. So uh aerospace uh, companies have uh, programs nasa has uh, programs all that kind of stuff and this kind of thinking which began in um, defense and aerospace has really worked its way into the rest of uh, pm so people look for an opportunity to manage several projects in a coordinated way and treat them as the program because they think there's advantage in doing that, okay? That it, uh, the incremental effort uh, creates more optimal results. So the person who oversees this series of projects or program is called a program manager. And typically they act as the bosses or the supervisors for the project uh, managers themselves. Uh, here on slide nine, we're talking about the triple constraint, and this is a really appealing idea. Okay, um, there are a lot of constraints on the project, and as we go through um, the PMI point of view on uh, uh, PM, we're going to see that according to PMI, there are uh, ten knowledge areas and each of these uh, can be thought of as uh, placing a constraint on the project 
And the biggest ones that we're going to talk about here first are the scope, what's in the project, the cost, how much it costs, and the time, how long it's going to take. Okay. Um, and we can think about these in a kind of a really useful way as being able to trade off against each other. Um, you can think of these uh, uh, constraints as being interrelated and kind of a mix, okay? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with an approach for our project that gives us the right mix of scope, cost, and time. And of course, all of the other um, uh, considerations as well. Scope, cost, and time are special because of a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they're the three uh, constraints on projects that get the most airtime when you talk to people about uh, projects. What's important? What went wrong? What went right? Scope, cost, and time, they talk about a lot, okay? Um, the next thing is that most people feel that it's okay to trade these kind of things off, that there's nothing magical about the scope, what's in and what's out of, of a project, that you can have a rational discussion about a project with a smaller co uh, a scope, one with a larger one, the same for time, the same for cost. Whereas some other things we have less flexible ideas about. What kind of things? Quality, okay? Human resources, communications. We generally have a narrow band of what we think are acceptable approaches in each of those areas, okay? So the big trade-offs come in scope and time and cost. And the project manager um, should really see these things as interrelated. I like to... Um, I like to tell people that they are interrelated in a way like the parts of a whack-a-mole game. Now, if you've seen the whack-a-mole game, there's a, there's a mole that uh, 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 pops up to its ugly head in one of the holes on the board, and you take a mallet and you smash it down. And then uh, another mole pops up, or perhaps it's the same one, who knows, in another hole, and then you smash that down. And, and what happens is that uh, as you change one, as you smash one mole, because of the interrelated aspects of the mechanism of the whack-a-mole game, other moles emerge. Well, it's, that, it's typically like that with uh, scope and time and cost. So for instance, if we're working on a project and somebody says, oh, you know what? We don't have the scope right here we should include this whole other group of people or this whole other group of requirements. Um, and you can say, yeah, we could. I can see why you're saying that we should, but I just want you to remember that's going to increase our cost and the length of time that it's going to take. Okay? Or perhaps uh, somebody comes into your office and says, um, we've just been given extra funding um, provided that we can get the project done in half the time. And you can say, well, geez, that's an interesting idea, but doing things faster usually increases cost all by itself. And it might be that the only way that we can get the, get the work done in half the time is to reduce the scope, perhaps cut the scope in half, perhaps cut it by two thirds. So, this kind of talking um, amongst the people who are senior players on a project, we consider to be healthy talking. The fact that these three things are interrelated, the fact that it's okay to trade them off, and the fact that we want to do that in a, a fairly thoughtful way. So these uh, three things uh, together are called the triple constraint and the trading off of the uh, the triple constraints uh, can lead to a lot of really productive talk and thinking um, and good project management. So formal definition of project management, it's the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to meet project requirements. 
okay? Project requirements are big things. Project requirements are a, a list of things that the project has to deliver, either products or processes, um, in order to meet its goals, okay? So project managers strive to meet the triple constraint, scope, time, and cost, and also facilitate the entire process to meet the needs and expectation of the project stakeholders. This may be the first time we use the word stakeholders. Stakeholders are um, everybody who has an interest in the project, everybody who's got some skin in the game. All right, on slide 11, we have a uh, kind of a summary slide. This highlights one of the two major classification schemes that we're going to use for uh, PM. And this is the knowledge areas, or these are the knowledge areas. Okay, there are 10 of them. There are four across the top. I call them the big four, scope, time, cost, and quality. Um, there are five across the bottom, human resource, communications, risk, procurement, and stakeholder management. Okay, and then there's one that runs down the middle in this big arrow, project integration management. We think it's a knowledge area, but we also think that it's a very special one. It's the one where we pull all the other ones together and uh, integrate them into a working um, uh, project. So project integration is kind of the secret sauce, okay? Um, it's the je ne sais quoi of uh, PM, um, and it's the 10th skill area or knowledge area. Project stakeholders. Project stakeholders are people involved or affected by project activities. Now, this is a pretty wide view, okay? So stakeholders include the project sponsor, project manager, anybody on the project team who is actually doing work on the project, support staff, customers of the organization, users of some kind of IT system, suppliers, and how about this, opponents to the project, okay? Anybody who could potentially engage with the project and make that project easier uh, or harder or have a positive reaction to the project or a negative one, they're all considered stakeholders in this uh, kind of larger theoretical uh, sense. So um, here are the knowledge areas that we saw a couple of slides ago in the diagram. Um, so PMI has identified 10 project management knowledge areas. And I think they do a good job of uh, dividing up the PM knowledge world um, with the 10 that they have. So they describe key competencies that project managers must develop. Um, and these are project integration, scope, time, cost, quality, human resource, communications, risk, procurement, and stakeholder management. And the text is organized according to this knowledge area scheme. So once we get into it, we're going to go through the knowledge areas one at a time. Um, while we're going through the knowledge areas, we are going to be introduced to a succession of project management tools and techniques that uh, relate to the knowledge area. Okay, so for instance, what kind of tools and techniques will we learn about? Well, we'll learn about a project uh, charter. We'll learn about a scope statement. We'll learn about a work breakdown structure, or WBS. We'll learn about Gantt charts, network diagrams, critical path analysis, critical chain scheduling, cost estimates, and earned value management. Okay, so there, there's, a, there's a whole slew of tools and techniques that we're going to learn in this course, and we're going to organize them generally uh, by the knowledge areas. 
Um, does everybody use every tool or technique on every project? No. Why? Well, because this is a pretty deep tool bag, okay? And so we have some things that are pretty special purpose. And also, um, if you took everything out of your tool bag to work on the management of a very small project, then the amount of overhead that you get would not be optimal, okay? So the project management effort would be out of whack with the, you know, the pure project effort itself. So are there tools and techniques that get used quite a bit? Yeah, there are. And Kathy Schwabe, the author of our text, calls these super tools. So super tools are those that have a high use and high potential for improving project success, such as software for task scheduling, something like Microsoft Project, scope statements, requirements analyses, lessons learned reports. Um, Tools already extensively used that have been found to improve project importance include progress reports, kickoff meetings, Gantt ch charts, change requests. So how did we get this? Well, um, researchers went out and talked to uh, PMs and said, well, what do you use most often? And this was a list that they got back. Okay, so um, uh, we offer this here so that you'll uh, maybe have a higher level of interest in these um, uh, to make sure that they don't go by without you paying a lot of attention to them. And uh, really to give you an idea about uh, the pattern of practice in the PM world. Um, so our friends in the Standish group didn't just do a single study. Um, they did a follow up in 2012. So let's see in 2012. How long had gone? Uh, how much time had gone by? Is that 18 years? Yeah, I think 18 years had gone by. So a long time. And uh, here's what they found. The number of successful IT projects more than uh, doubled from 16% to 39%. The number of failed projects decreased from 31% to 18%. And success rates were much higher for small projects and for larger ones, 76% versus 10%. So you can draw the conclusions that you want to from this. Um, I'll give you hints about the conclusions that I draw. Um, that time period, uh, 1994 to 2012, has coincided with an increased interest in formal PM in uh, the IT world. And so there really is an, you know, there is a real improvement um, in uh, that time frame, okay? Some of that improvement has to do with this last uh, bullet that has to do with the size of uh, projects. Um, people have found that the larger the project, the higher the probability is that it's going to fail. Um, and this really, this has to do with uh, human nature, um, it's hard to coordinate a lot of people towards a single goal, okay? Um, it also has to do with the fact that the world changes. So the longer that you take to do a project, the higher the probability that the world will change and your, your requirements will have shifted before you get done, okay? So a lot of the good thinking of formal APM is keep your projects reasonably small. And so um, the fact that we're doing a higher proportion of small projects could, uh, could really account for the improvement that we're seeing. And the other thing is that um, if you look at the time frame of the original chaos study, 1994, this was really 
uh, sort of the middle of, of the ramp up in the dot com boom. And the dot com boom had a lot of people uh, managing IT projects who were highly inexperienced. They were highly inexperienced not only with um, uh, project management tools and techniques, but also with IT. There just was a lot of demand and we pulled lots of people in. So some of this um, improvement from uh, 1994 to 2012 has to do with the fact that somewhere around 2001 or 2002, we we had a dot com turned into dot bomb and we just had a lot of fallout. And a lot of the people who fell out of the industry and uh, fell out of the practice were the the people of uh, lesser talent and experience. Um, so um, as sort of a survival of the fittest has uh, has accounted for uh, some of the improvement as well. So um, generally speaking, we think that good formal PM ideas uh, had uh, a significant impact on this improvement and that we think this should be a motivation to con continue with more of same. Now, how do you know that a project has succeeded? Okay, well, sometimes it's a little bit hard to define. We can say that the project met scope, time and cost goals but I'm just going to, I've raised this before. Did we meet the original goals or did we meet the goals as they evolved over the life of the project? We have a satisfied customer or sponsor, okay? The results of the project met its main objectives, such as making or saving a certain amount of money, providing a good return on investment, or simply making the sponsors happy, okay? So it's pretty clear that if you don't have happy people, especially the sponsors at the end of the project, um, you're not really gonna have a good outcome, okay? Because your ability to continue in this line of work has to do with um, either that particular sponsor or people who might be associated with that particular sponsor giving you further work, okay? So that is uh, your minimum uh, definition of success, uh, okay? So we don't want to get to the end of a project and say, well, um, no, we met all of our time, scope, and cost goals, but the sponsor was angry, but that's okay because we met the time, scope, and cost goals. Um, Angry sponsor um, is uh, is a dead failure, okay? Um, you would do better to uh, have whatever experience that you're going to have on the scope, the time, and the cost, and have a happy uh, customer and sponsor at the end. So this uh, process of going through the project and uh, developing our ideas about scope, time, and cost over time and doing that in a, uh, a participative and constructive way, I'm gonna say can lead to happy customers and sponsors, okay? And that's the, uh, that's the kind of ultimate project success that we're going to look for. Now, uh, what kind of things help a project succeed, a lot of people would think, I mean, just kind of a, a common man on the street, woman on the street kind of thinking about an IT or technically related project would be that um, one of the most important things would be the knowledge of the technology. Uh, and that uh, maybe you would think that would be the most important thing. And yet, when you go back and look at people who have worked on these, these IT projects, they tell you about things that are important and they're a little surprising. So 
here's the order of the top 10 things that help these projects, these IT projects uh, succeed. Executive support, user involvement, clear business objectives, emotional maturity, at optimizing the scope, agile process, project management expertise. Now, number eight, skilled resources. There's the technical skills. They're coming in at number eight. Nine, execution, 10 tools and infrastructure. So this is pretty interesting stuff, okay? Pretty interesting stuff indeed. So I think the takeaway from the slide here is that uh, there are a lot of non-technical things that are pretty important in helping a project succeed. That's not to say that the technical aspects are not important, but there maybe are more important things that you wouldn't automatically think of or pay attention to. And we're trying to catch your attention with that. Um, the federal government seems to be a little bit different animal than the rest of us. So um, the research has indicated that on federal IT projects, what are the top three that help uh, projects uh, succeed? Adequate funding, staff expertise is number two, engagement from all the stakeholders is number three. So um, it looks like for those uh, projects, it's one thing to get people to tell you to go do a project. It's another thing to get them to actually fund it. So uh, what do winners do? Recent research findings show that companies excel in project, companies that excel in project delivery capability have some common behaviors. They use an integrated PM toolbox. So they have standard PM tools. They have lots of templates for things. That means that not every project manager has to invent the project management infrastructure themselves. It also means that they share a common language and set of tools. So these are pretty important things. They grow project leaders emphasizing business and soft skills. So they not only try to develop people technically within their IT organization, but they try to develop them in terms of being good project managers and leaders as well. They develop a streamlined project delivery process, so they have a way that they do things and people know about it. Um, and they measure project health using metrics like customer satisfaction or return on investment, which is to say that they have an eye towards the results that they're getting from whatever uh, behavior they're, uh, you know, they're currently uh, emitting. Okay, so um, a little bit earlier in the chapter, we talked about the uh, the interest in grouping projects in a way to not just think of them individually. Okay, and we talked about a program, right? Uh, a program is a group of related projects managed in a coordinated way to obtain benefits and control not available from managing them individually. And who does this? Well, a program manager provides the leadership and direction for the project managers heading the projects within the program. Um, Examples of common programs in the IT field include infrastructure, applications, development, and user support. So that's programs. What about portfolios? Well, um, this idea of portfolio management is something that came to the fore in uh, financial thinking in the 1960s. So people started not to talk about just 
individual investments that they had, they started to talk about a portfolio of investments that they had. And um, they came to believe that it was more important to look at the behavior of their investments as a group than just to look at them each of them individually. Well, this kind of portfolio analysis and thinking has been extended to projects in the last uh, 20 years. So um, as part of project portfolio management, organizations group and manage projects and programs as a portfolio of investments, because that's what projects are, because they take resources, that contribute to the entire enterprise's success. Portfolio managers help their organizations make wise investment decisions by helping to select and analyze projects from a strategic perspective. So it's important for us to realize that uh, not only do we have to have to pick each project that we're going to pursue or to continue to pursue wisely, but we have to we have to be satisfied at the end of the day that the the collection of them and their interaction with each other um, is optimal. OK, and um, so among other things, um, you've probably heard uh, people talk about their financial portfolio that they want diversification. So they don't want all their eggs in one basket. So they don't want to put all of their money into uh, petroleum stocks. Well, the same thing for uh, projects, okay? An organization is not going to want to put, in terms of, say, IT projects, all of their e investment into large uh, new IT technology uh, projects. That probably is not going to be an optimal strategy over time. Um, so here on slide 23, we're contrasting uh, project management compared to project portfolio management. So project management is uh, focused on tactical goals. Okay, are we carrying out projects well? Are projects on time and on budget? Do project stakeholders know what they should be doing? Whereas in contrast, portfolio management is trying to focus on strategic goals of the organizations. Are we working on the right projects? Are we investing in the right areas? Do we have the right resources to be uh, competitive? So project portfolio management sort of has a higher level and longer term view. Um, let's see, best practice. So uh, these days, uh, best practice is uh, a common phrase that we use all the time. We have this idea that in our profession or in our um, industry, that there will be uh, some of the players who, who do things the best and their practices will be best uh, uh, practices, okay? Um, and a lot of people are, are sort of in search of uh, best uh, practices to bring to their organization. Um, uh, so uh, Robert uh, Buttrick this suggests that organizations need to follow the basic principles of PM, including these two that were mentioned earlier in the chapter. Make sure that your projects are driven by your strategy in terms of how you choose them and how you pursue them. Be able to demonstrate how each project you undertake fits your business strategy and screen out unwanted projects as soon as possible. Engage your stakeholders. Ignoring its stakeholders often leads to project failure. Be sure to engage your stakeholders at all stages of a project and encourage teamwork and commitment at all times. So um, Robert Buttrick, I think, does a pretty good job of 
telling us to keep our eye on the ball, okay? Um, it's not just individual projects, okay? We want to make sure that the projects that we choose are appropriate collectively, particularly in line with our strategy. And we ought to be really, really sensitive to the stakeholders, particularly the sponsors, but not only the sponsors, to make sure that people are going to be happy with what we're doing for them, because that's the major goal. OK, our goal, it, 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 I would say that if we have to choose between doing things right and making people happy, well, then I think I would rather th that we do things not quite so right and have happier people at the end than if we do things right in some kind of absolute sense and have unhappy stakeholders. Because as soon as you get unhappy stakeholders, um, you lose the ability to continue on, right? So we always need to please stakeholders in the long run. Um, here on slide 25 is an example of uh, project portfolio approaches and thinking as applied to a particular organization. So um, there, on the left side, we see a kind of a 3D pie chart. So we would uh, perhaps, uh, we have all the activities of the business, marketing, HR, materials, IT. That's uh, apparently we're not seeing all the pieces. And, um, you know, but those are all the, uh, for instance, are there no engineering projects? I don't know. It doesn't look like it. Um, but we take the IT projects and then we might want to look at them with uh, the following kind of uh, view. Uh, in this analysis, um, we're recommending that you look at core projects, growth projects, and venture pr projects. So core projects run the business as it currently exists. Growth help you grow the business. And venture projects help you transform the business. Does everybody use this uh, terminology? No, one particular set of authors did, and we decided to make a slide out of it. And it's also important to see that some of our expenditures on projects are really going to be non-discretionary because, for instance, unless we take care of the core, then that part of the business is going to erode, okay? and some other parts are going to be more uh, discretionary because uh, you know we're going to have to decide which things we're going to invest in for the future so we've got to take care of the present and invest in the future so this is one particular point of view about how to look at project portfolios analytically Um, there are a number of products that help you do project portfolio management. So Microsoft has one, okay? Um, there are, uh, so uh, we have some, uh, we have some, add-on high-end products that uh, complement uh, um, Microsoft Project that allow you to do portfolio management analysis, okay? Uh, there's another uh, product, probably much more high-end than uh, Microsoft Microsoft uh, project a family of things, and it's uh, a product called Plan View, and it has uh, things for uh, scheduling and tracking projects, and a lot of stuff that allow you to to analyze your projects in a portfolio kind of way. So 
there are, there are a number of vendors who've created software uh, to help you um, manage your, your portfolio of uh, projects and analyze your uh, portfolio in what they consider to be a potentially helpful way. Now let's talk a little bit about the role of the PM, okay? Um, uh, job descriptions for the PM job vary, but most include responsibilities like planning, scheduling, coordinating, uh, working with people to achieve project goals. Uh, there's a statistic in the text, 97% of successful projects were led by experienced project managers who can often help influence success uh, factors. I've often had a hard time taking this and realizing how you turn that statistic into an action plan, okay? So um, if you're an inexperienced project manager, okay, then that means that you only have a 3% chance of succeeding? Well, it doesn't mean that. It can't mean that. Um, it probably means, probably the best thing that we have, that there's nothing like experience. So the more experience that we can get on projects, either as the project manager or as a, some kind of key player, this is going to raise the possibility of our success as a PM in the future. It's probably the optimistic way to look at that uh, statistic. And what are some of the suggested skills that our PM should have? Well, they should know um, both the knowledge areas and the process groups that we're going to learn about in the course. Um, that's the uh, that's what makes up the project management body of knowledge as uh, promoted by the PMI organization. Um, they should have knowledge of the application area. They should know the business things that um, they're trying to work in. They should know standards and regulations, project environment knowledge. Uh, what's happening in the world around the project, both inside and outside of the organization. General uh, management knowledge and skills. So they ought to know about uh, being a general manager. Uh, so what's that? Well, that'd be a people who, a person who would run a business um, that would be in the library and information science world, that would be a library director, that would be a... Uh, person who is the head of an archive, right? And they should know uh, soft skills or human relations uh, skills. Okay, and I don't think you find that too surprising. We'd like the PM to be knowledgeable in the specific information having to do with the project, but we also want them to be a well-rounded kind of a generalist. Um, here's the results of a study in which we asked uh, people what were the 10 most important skills and competencies for PMs. So let's look at what's here and what order they show up in. People skills, leadership, listening, integrity, um, trust building, verbal communication, team building, conflict resolution and management critical thinking, understands and balances priorities. Now, in the top 10, we haven't gotten to technical skills yet. And I don't want to say that technical skills are not important, okay? But um, uh, these more general kind of soft skills that we have here have, uh, have clogged up the top 10. So when you go and you ask uh, people what they want out of a PM, uh, this is what they tell you, okay? Now, uh, the world is uh, not uniform, okay? And projects are not all the same. And project managers are not all the same. 
Uh, and so we might want to pick the right project manager for the right kind of project. So here's a, here's a little a tactical stuff that we could use to help to match the right project manager to the right opportunity. So we've got uh, three kinds of projects, large projects, high uncertainty projects, and very novel projects. So in large projects, we're looking for leadership, relevant prior experience, planning, people skills, communication, team building skills. In high uncertainty projects, we're looking for risk management, expectation management, leadership, people skills, and planning skills. In very novel projects, leadership, people skills, vision and goals, self-confidence, expectation management, and listening skills. So these skills are all important, but there are there is some tuning that we can do to pick the right people to manage the right projects. Leadership is a really big part of uh, being a PM. Okay, uh, that's because I uh, personally I think of the PM as a facilitator rather than a boss. So the more that you think of yourself as a boss, then you think of yourself as a great uh, decider, right? You're going to come up with great ideas, okay? The more that you think of yourself as a facilitator, you see yourself as a person who's going to facilitate uh, high organizational output. And this is what I think really leads to the, kind, uh, to the right kind of leadership thinking. So a leader focuses on long-term goals and big picture objectives while inspiring people to reach those goals. A manager deals with the day-to-day -day details of meeting specific goals. Project managers often take on the role of both leader and manager. So this is, I think, kind of interesting, but so, the manager is doing follow-up to make sure that we meet up the goals. So there's a part of being a PM that's uh, uh, kind of mundane. It's uh, administrative, a lot of follow-up. The leader is is uh, is inspiring people. Is um, um, uh, facilitating great accomplishments. Okay. You'll mention that nobody in the world, nobody here, nothing has been said about being the boss. So people who haven't had management responsibility often think of being a project manager as being the boss. And I think that certainly there is a role of being the boss and having authority and having, having to do that well. And we'll talk about a lot of that when we get to human resources. But... Um, the leader and the manager aspects of this, I think, uh, kind of overshadow the boss aspects by a great deal. Um, at least in the IT field, uh, project managers are uh, in high demand. So uh, in a 2014 survey, IT executives listed the 10 hottest skills they plan to hire for in 2015. Project management was second only to programming and application development. Even if you choose to stay in a technical role, you still need project management knowledge and skills to help your team and organization. So this is really here to take people who uh, see themselves not so much as a project manager, but more as a a technician or a technocrat, to, a technocrat to realize that there's a pretty high demand for them to develop themselves in this uh, uh, PM way. So here's a list of the 10 hottest IT skills. And you'll see that number two is project management. And this isn't too far out of date. This is uh, about a year out of date. That's pretty recent. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the project management profession here. Now, um, you have to kind of understand who's talking. Okay, so this uh, curriculum was uh, developed by Kathy Schwabe in uh, response to the PMI organization's project management body of knowledge, the PMBOK. And uh, PMI really sees itself as a, a professionalizer of uh, project management. So they think that it's important, and it's certainly important to PMI's uh, health, that we think of uh, project management as a profession. Um, and so uh, uh, we come to this part of the uh, course, okay? So what's, uh, what's the history of project management well people can see sort of by reasoning that there are some really ancient achievements of civilizations like uh, the building of the pyramids in Egypt or the Great Wall of China that uh, took uh, some planning and coordination that would be um, that would be uh, significant by modern standards, okay? And uh, so we've been doing project management for a long time. Um, now, the Egyptian pyramids and the Great Wall of China were probably built by either uh, some combination of soldiers and slaves, okay? And probably that's not what we want to achieve anymore. So um, the fact is that uh, we may have achieved uh, great things thousands of years ago, but um, we certainly want to continue to evolve our approach to have it match our current sensibilities. Most people consider the Manhattan Project, which was the project to build the first atomic bomb, or atomic bombs, actually they built two, to be the first use of modern project management. So a lot of the tools and the techniques that we talk about here um, in the course, things like work breakdown structure, things like uh, um, uh, something we're going to call about PERT, these are all things that came out of the defense contracting and uh, aerospace industries because these were really in modern times the first really big uh, projects of a, a technical nature that had to be done okay so um, the Manhattan Project happened during World War II and so most of the tools and techniques that we're learning have uh, have roots in either the kinds of organizational things that were done during World War II or uh, since then. Uh, here's a tool that's been around for a long time. It's called a Gantt chart, and it's actually been around a little bit longer than World War II. Um, this is a... Uh, it, this is a way to take a group of uh, tasks that make up a project and to visualize when we're expecting them to happen on the calendar. So we identify the tasks in the, the text area on the left and we see when we're expecting those uh, tasks to happen and how long we expect them to take in the calendar portion on the right. This particular one was uh, created with a uh, Microsoft project. Here's another um, a diagram that was created by a Microsoft Project, and this is a network a diagram. And this is a diagram not quite so much for the end users of project management outputs, but this allows the, 
the project manager or other people who are working on the plan to see the logic of all the tests and how they relate to each other. Um, now, there's a, a really important movement um, afoot in uh, big organizations uh, around the world and particularly in the US. As project management has become professionalized, this idea that we ought to have a project management office and maybe a chief project management officer. Um, and this is a, a bit of a mixed bag, okay? Um, there are some places where the uh, project management office, uh, uh, also called the PMO, uh, is seen as a great place. Uh, these are people who know a lot about the tools and techniques we're going to be learning about, and they, uh, they're out to help people. So we're from corporate and we're here to help. Um, it's very hard uh, for individual project managers to create all the infrastructure that you need to do a good job of managing uh, uh, projects. Um, we need to acquire tools and we need to create templates for things. There are times when we need some extra planning and analytical help that it'd be great to be able to borrow those kind of people from a PMO. Um, and so in some organizations, they're kind of seen as the project management angels. Okay. In some organization, they're seen as sort of the, if you watch the cop shows, uh, you know, the police uh, department always has this internal affairs or professional standards, the rat squad, um, who are universally hated. They're usually, they're universally hated because they're uh, Budinskis, right? They are overseeing things. They're looking for people who are making mistakes. They're looking for people who are doing things differently and they want to stamp that out. Uh, so to the extent that PMIs have become sort of the eternal internal affairs of project management, um, they're hated. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, so um, you can go to different organizations and talk to different people. And there are people who love the PMO. There are people who want to be in the PMO. There are people who hate the PMO. There are people who dread the day that they ever got assigned to the PMO. And it really relates to how much of a group of PM angels the PMO is and how much it's the rat squad. So um, that's not the official line from PMI, but that's the official line from uh, Kevin. OK, so PMOs are sort of a mixed bag. They're an important trend in uh, PM that you ought to know about. And you ought to know that they could lead to some very good things or perhaps to a lot of friction. And you're going to have to examine things to figure out which this particular PMO is and how it relates to you. So here's the growth in the numbers of PMOs. Um, the percentage of companies with uh, PMOs uh, 2047 percent, 2006 77, 2010 84, 2014 drops to 80. Okay, so some of this euphoria over having a uh, a uh, uh, project management office has uh, kind of died down between 2010 and 2014. Um, we always get a global issues slide here. Um, several global dynamics are forcing organizations to rethink their practices. Uh, talent development for project and program managers is a top concern. And I, I think that's true. Uh, certainly, general managers who run organizations uh, 
They know that they spend a lot of their money in projects and they know that they want to develop the people who are going to oversee that. Uh, good project and portfolio management uh, is crucial in tight economic conditions and we've certainly had those. Uh, basic project management techniques are core competencies. That's consistent with what we said before. Organizations want to use more agile approaches to project management. And we haven't, there was a hint about agile earlier on. Uh, there's a movement afoot in project management to uh, come up with a simplified approach to managing projects, particularly in IT projects, but not only IT projects. So there is this agile uh, project management approach, and um, it's lighter, okay? It makes lesser claims about what you can achieve through project uh, management. Um, and it, uh, it's an interesting force. Now, we're not going to see a lot about Agile in the, in the current chapter, but uh, we will uh, talk about it in the next couple of chapters, and I'll be talking about it throughout the uh, course. So it's, uh, it's a lighter, more Agile version of PM. Um, the people who are the proponents of it believe that they invented it and they invented all things good. Um, so there's, uh, there's no shortage of people who are proponents of Agile who, PM who think that they, uh, they've cornered the market on great thinking. So um, it be interesting to talk about it with you as the course develops. Um, and benefits realization of projects is a key, key, key metric. Most people believe that if we're going to be serious about managing projects, we're going to have to measure their uh, results. And you would think that's just something that everybody does, but the fact is it's not. Okay, so um, a lot of people do a lot of analysis up front about what the potential benefits are of projects, and then they do projects and they don't go back and measure. Um, why? Well, because they have their head in the next project, or maybe they really don't want to know. Um, this isn't really a course about uh, PMI, but this is a slide on the Project Management I Institute. I've been saying that it's formed in 1966, and I can see it was formed in 1969. Um, this is really the, uh, not the only, but the largest uh, professional organization for project managers in the world. It's particularly dominant in the U.S. Um, it has uh, a very big following in a wide range of industries and uh, professions, including IT, including uh, library and information science. Um, they have done a lot to develop the language um, uh, surrounding project uh, management and to standardize it. They've done a lot to set professional expectations. And in addition to all that, they've, they've run a certification uh, process. Their uh, most popular uh, certification is PMP, Project management uh, professional. I've had that certification for uh, 11 years now. And I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, anybody who would like to know more about PMI and uh, PMP and other certifications, uh, feel free to contact me and we'll talk about it offline. Um, one of the things that PMI has done that I think is pretty good stuff is, uh, as any professional organization will, they've addressed the ethical issues associated with managing uh, projects. 
And they've come up with a set of ethical standards that if you're going to uh, be a member of the organization, which you can do without being certified, and definitely if you're going to be certified, you have to subscribe to. And it, it's a pretty good set of uh, ethical uh, principles. It has to do with uh, telling people the truth, uh, trying to do good, uh, not misleading people and all that kind of stuff. And it's particularly helpful in a world where um, if people with competing ideas are have some um, incentive to lie about, um, say, the true cost of their approach. And so you'll see, um, you know, you'll see people saying, uh, well, I don't know why Kevin thinks that's going to take a year to do. I can do that in four months, right? So uh, in a project management world, having a set of ethics about the way that we analyze things and the way that we tell the truth and that the standards that we use for our behavior, I think can lead to good, uh, good results. And so uh, the, ethical ether, the ethical efforts of PMI are uh, generally a good thing. Uh, we always end chapters here with a list of software um, that we can use to help us get the job done with uh, stuff we've talked about within the chapter. So um, there are three main categories of tools um, that we can use to help us with project management. Uh, Low-end tools, things that we can use on a single project or a smaller project, cost under $200 per users. Mid-range tools handle multiple projects and users. They cost $200 to $1,000. Um, project 2013 is the most uh, popular. And high-end tools, also called enterprise project management software, often uh, licensed on a per-user basis. And that would include um, oh, um, a project software, like things like uh, Plan View. Okay? So, um, there's a, there's a whole gamut of uh, software that you can use for planning projects, tracking projects, reporting on the status of uh, projects. And there's really something for every budget and every level of sophistication. One tool that gets uh, particularly wide uh, treatment in the textbook is uh, Microsoft Project. It's because it's a very popular tool. And um, for those of you in my uh, class um, at uh, uh, when I am recording this, this is for um, the University of Illinois um, School of Information Sciences, as we're calling ourselves as of this month. And um, students and faculty at the school are entitled to a free copy of uh, a Microsoft uh, Project. So I think um, e even though we don't cover it explicitly in the course, it's something that you may want to go uh, check out. So you're able to download it from the web store. Um, even if you're paying for it, it's an affordable project. Um, it's an affordable product, and it's a great kind of place to start. There are a lot of free things on the web that do a whole lot less, and there are a number of uh, for pay things, uh, like, say, PlanView, that do a whole lot more. But uh, it's an interesting kind of entry point. There's an appendix in the back of the textbook um, that can help you learn how to use it. And uh, for those of you who are going to be wanting to use these kind of tools, uh, it's a great place to start. So that is it for chapter one. I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye bye.